Welcome to Legends, a series that delves into the lore within Horizon Forbidden West. In this video, we'll be turning our focus to those who hold the cycle of the natural world in the highest reverence, the Utaru. As with all tribes we know to have originated in North America, the ancestors of the Utaru can be traced back to those released from the Cradle of Eleuthia 9 in present-day Colorado, or what would come to be known as the Nora Sacred Land in the 31st century. Though the ancestors of the Nora would remain close to their cradle of origin, others would depart, seeking their own place in this reborn world, and form unique cultures and societies based on their interpretations of the ancient past. Those who would become the Utaru set out to the west, enduring many challenges until what would become their homeland revealed itself. Atop a cliff in a place later dubbed as the Promontory by the tribe, the Utaru first laid eyes on the ruins of the Western Grand Array. Originally constructed to identify resource-rich asteroids for off-planet mining operations by the Old Ones, these massive satellite dishes would provide safe haven in the earliest days of the tribe and become the capital of Plainsong. Along with the protection offered by the dishes, these people had also stumbled upon a system that would provide and sustain the tribe for generations to come and inform much of their most sacred beliefs. As the last era of humanity drew to a close in the 21st century, the systems of Zero Dawn were coming to fruition, each piece essential to ensuring life would have another chance on a reborn world. In the mountains southwest of the Western Grand Array, the regional command center was constructed. A facility intended to be utilized by Apollo-educated humans born from Eleuthia 9 to utilize the terraforming systems of ZD for themselves to begin the rebuilding of a better world. Unfortunately, due to the purge of the Apollo Archive by Ted Farrow in 2066, these new humans would never receive this education, and the command center would never fulfill its intended purpose. Despite this, many of the systems designed to support the intended population of the RCC would work as originally intended, one of which were the automated farms meant to supply ongoing sustenance for humans in the area farms that would coincidentally surround the area that Plainsong was established. For the Utaru, these self-renewing harvests would be seen as nothing less than a miracle, and the machines that provided these bounties came to be viewed as deities that walked among them and given names based on the musical education system, Solfege. The Utaru would come upon this musical knowledge of the Old Ones thanks to the ancient dishes themselves. Each programmed by a more whimsical member of the Western Grand Array in the ancient past to sound off the scales through the alarm system as the dishes aligned. The natural cycle of growth, decay, and renewal became cornerstones of Utaru culture, personified each day by the land gods who provided for the tribe without fail. These eight plow horns would work the land continuously, a mission only interrupted by routine maintenance. These moments of departure by a land god would take on great importance, creating a calendar of eight unique and hallowed festivals to mark their pilgrimage to the Sacred Cave, a place where only the machines may go. The land gods always held to the same order to venture forth, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, and finally Do. A cycle repeating and unbroken year after year, two days after leaving, they would return, almost new, with all traces of earth and worship washed away. Each land god's festival came to reflect the time of year it would travel back to the repair bay. The festival of So is celebrated in the fall, with the beginning of the harvest and with wine made from elderflowers. Tea departs in the winter, when the grain is stowed away. This is a season of gratitude for the tribe, where children receive gifts in celebration. Do, who would venture away at the end of winter, would herald the beginning of spring, and many would rejoice with songs of new beginnings. Though the land gods would leave, painted with many markings of adoration and reverence from those who they provided for, they would return clean and restored, an occurrence that would only reinforce the Utaru sentiments towards decay and renewal. For the tribe, the cycle of life and death are truly intertwined. At a young age, or for some even at birth, each Utaru is given a pouch containing seeds. These seeds are sacred, as they will be carried with them for as long as they live, 
and will be planted after their passing. As their bodies are returned to the earth, aiding in the growth of new life, these seeds bloom and are tended by those who cared for them in life, honoring those who have passed. Many of these seeds are planted in Plainsong or to the north past the old growth forest in the settlement of River Him. The grove there carries great significance because of this, and those who reside there take great pride in its care. However, seeds carried by those who committed grievous crimes in life are not permitted to be planted among the tribe. Rather, they are cast into the rivers to be carried away to distant lands where they may find a new start to hopefully take root and grow elsewhere. Traditions like these tie the Utaru to their lands in a way that is truly unique among the tribes of the 31st century, for as it said, a tree cannot pick up its roots as fire approaches. This has forced the Utaru to adapt in different ways to overcome the hostile lands they call their own. Leading the tribe is a council known as the Chorus. Through discussion and debate, this small group dictates much of the tribe's direction. Though their culture often displays a philosophy of balance and harmony, the Chorus is not above political motivations. When the Chorus is in disharmony, the tribe sings, in hopes their melodies will serve to soothe whatever impasse has stopped the council's work. Those chosen to be members are selected by those who are already among the Chorus, often entrenching power and inhibiting change in favor of tradition. Those outside the chorus can work to grow their sphere of influence in order to earn their place, and if the timing and situation is right, they may ascend, as these appointments are made in the public eye. Once someone is selected to join the chorus, they must partake in the rite of discovery to make the appointment official. This pilgrimage will take them back to where the first of the tribe beheld plain song, at the promontory they will adorn themselves with paints around their eyes and play their song before the stone altar. The final act of this ritual would have them paint on the promontory itself, as every chorus member had done before them. As far as tribal neighbors are concerned, the Utaru reside just east of Tanakh territory, a culture renowned for their warrior prowess and constant war between the clans an incredibly dangerous society if they were ever to become aggressive towards the Utaru. Thankfully, due to their political acumen, the peaceful Utaru and the warring Tanakh have lived in relative peace with one another thanks to a unique exchange between them. What originally began as gifts of grain to the Tanakh to ensure the peace between them eventually evolved into an exchange of people. To replenish losses from intertribal warfare among the Tanakh clans, young blood was always needed. The Utaru would offer up the young of their tribe to eventually become Tanakh warriors, and in exchange, highly experienced but aging warriors would be given to the Utaru to help train their defenders, wardens to patrol the old growth forest, and harvesters that could reap more than their crops. Those Tanakh that would become Utaru are known as veterans and are held in high esteem among the tribe. This tradition was honored for many years without interruption, but there would come a time where this would fall by the wayside, and the lives of those in Plainsong would be forever changed. In the year 3020, far to the east, Gaia would receive a transmission severing her from her subfunctions and lead to her ultimate destruction. Though this would have implications on a global scale, it would also have an immediate effect for the Utaru. To the west, the Tanakh would find themselves united under the rule of Chief Hakaro after seizing his final victory in the Memorial Grove. To the east, Jaron, the 13th Sun King of the Karja, had inherited a renewed military might built by his father, Hivas. With Gaia gone, the machine derangement of Hephaestus was about to begin, starting the Karja on a warpath that would last a decade an era known to the Utaru as the Buried Years, but is more commonly referred to as the Red Raids. Heeding the words of his sun priests, Jaron came to believe the increasing machine aggression and the steady appearance of new, more dangerous machines was the result of an angry sun, a god that could only be appeased through barbaric rites long since abandoned by the tribe. And so, Soldiers and blood hunters would spread across the lands, assaulting their tribal neighbors. 
Those who did not fall in battle would be captured and taken back to the Sundom for ritualistic sacrifice to the might of the machines. Eventually, the Mad Sun King would send his forces west to a land once forbidden to the Karja, where they would come upon the Utaru. The tribe had fighters for basic protection, but nowhere near what would be needed to stop the military might of the Sundom. Much like they had done with the Tanakh of the past, they tried to offer gifts of grain in exchange for the mercy of the raiders. This, however, could not slake the bloodlust of those who shared in Jaron's vision. Red raiders would venture forth from the fortress of Barren Light and savage the Utaru. By the Karja's own records, the violence was so extreme that the maize grew black and blue in the following harvests from the amount of blood spilt in their fields. In these desperate times, all the Utaru could do was try to survive the onslaught of capture and death. Despite the impossible odds the tribe faced and resistance from a fearful chorus, there were some that fought back and did what they could to slow the Sundom's war machine. Led by the Utaru Zo, a small group of guerrilla fighters using their knowledge of the land ambushed smaller raiding parties, sabotaged supply lines, and struck their encampments under the cover of night. Finally, when the Tanakh began to force the invaders back, these Utaru would join them. Together, they would defeat the Karja at Barren Light and leave the fortress in ruins as Jaron's armies were forced back to Meridian. This event would mark the end of the Red Raids in the Forbidden West. All those Utaru who fell during this time, whose seed pouches could be recovered, would be planted in the grove at the heart of River Him. As these deaths gave birth to new life, regrettably, this would not be the last hardship faced by the tribe. As the derangement sparked the horrors of the Red Raids, its change in the machines would affect other crucial aspects of Utaru life. The land god stopped returning to the sacred cave and became more brittle and frenzied with each passing day. The fields that had always sustained the tribe began to turn sour as a red blight starved all they hoped to grow. And as new and dangerous machines encroached into the plains, the tribe faced a slow and seemingly inevitable end. Even in these dire straits, traditionalists among the chorus were hesitant to adopt any changes to tribal life to improve their present situation. Some, like Kaylee, spoke out against the stagnation in hopes of finding solutions to ease the pain of her people. But when her radical views began to gain traction and an appointment to the chorus was all but certain, her voice was silenced. A murder in the name of saving tradition over the lives to ensure the future. The tribe's hopes did lift for a moment when the land god Fa departed for the cave. Many took this as an omen that the cycle would begin again, but when the plow horn didn't return, these feelings quickly faded. The state of the tribe would only take a turn for the better once the savior of Meridian found her way to Plainsong. Even with the disapproval of the chorus, events beyond their control would force the hand of Aloy, Zo, and Varl. After the machines defeated the defenders at the cordon, the three ventured into the sacred cave. Within, they would find Fa, but not as the Utaru had known it. The once docile terraformer, thanks to the work of Hephaestus, had become armed and dangerous. A transformation from Plowhorn to Grimhorn. Within the facility, they battled the machine until, much to the sorrow of Zo, Fa was brought down. After Hephaestus was forced from the facility, it was revealed that this was no ordinary cauldron, rather, Repair Bay Tau. Connected to the regional command center, explaining the unique pattern of restoration these machines had continued up until the derangement. After a time, both Aloy and Zo would work in their own ways to restore normalcy to the Utaru. Within the greenhouse facility on the coast, Aloy was able to obtain and reunite the subfunction Demeter with Gaia, allowing her to rid the blight from their lands. Gaia would also help Zo engineer reboot codes to the remaining land gods, restoring them to their original programming and purpose. Freed of their derangement, the land gods rang out in song, signaling a new beginning for the Utaru. Out of this decay, growth once again has returned to the tribe, and hopefully will remain for many years to come.
but much still hangs in the balance as they, along with the rest of the world, will soon face a threat more grave than any has come before. And that brings our journey to an end. If you'd like to see more content like this, likes and shares are always appreciated. And if you're hungry for more Horizon lore, consider subscribing and checking out the rest of our lore library. Also consider joining our channel's Discord, as well as our membership program to check out exclusive content about the lore of Horizon. And as always, thanks for watching and keep questing.